Kathy, I don't see anyone else joining. Okay. Uh, maybe it's okay to, we'll keep an eye on this and we can bring up the presentation. And if you okay, like that, that sounds great, Donna. Um, so as we open up, Tim Cooper is going to take up my put up my slides. Um, as Donna said earlier, we all we welcome you. We're we're delighted that you've joined us tonight for the forum. And as chair of the Elementary School Building Committee, I want to welcome everybody to the forum. We're at a I need the first slide, Tim. Yeah, we're at a key juncture as Amherst takes the next steps toward building a new elementary school. As we will describe this evening, we have the opportunity to build for the future, for our children, for our community, and for our climate. My role tonight is to provide, to outline the agenda, introduce Donna Danisco, who will speak on behalf of Danisco Design, the school architects, and I believe Tim Cooper also has a speaking role, and Margaret Wood from ANSWER, our owner's project manager who helps us all manage and oversee the project, including deal details involved with securing a facility grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. After my brief overview of the project and its status, Donna will present the site and building design, highlighting key elements that will enable flexibility and a highly energy efficient, sustainable building with robust opportunities for outdoor learning and play, including community fields. She'll also summarize the most recent cost estimates. Margaret will follow with an expanded view of costs, including estimates of the facility grant from MSBA and the projected timeline. Next slide, please. With the decline of enrollment in our elementary schools, we in Amherst can combine two schools that are operating well below capacity in buildings that have little to no insulation, aging, inefficient heating and cooling systems that were built in an era where air circulation, use of fossil fuels and energy costs were not concerns. As Donna will discuss, the education needs of the students and teachers inform the design with a focus on student-centered learning with an ability to work in small groups. Throughout the building, teachers and students will benefit from daylight in a site with robust outdoor learning spaces and spaces for teaching about the environment and natural resources. The Fort River site is truly remarkable for what it offers us. This will be our town's first net zero building. The design will meet the town's net zero bylaw in a well-insulated all electric building with PV arrays to offset utility costs. We estimate that we will save at least $250,000 a year in energy costs alone. Consolidating to one school will also save on other operating costs. The selection of Fort River site enables us to build a new building while the current school stays open with less disruption. At a time when even the costs of bricks and glass are escalating, the building committee working hard with designers have focused on selecting durable yet lower cost materials and a cost efficient three-story building. We expect to receive a facility grant from MSBA with official notice in April. But the cost of the school, given other needs of the town, will require a debt exclusion vote to help pay for the town share. This is scheduled for May 2nd. Today's forum and yesterday's and future meetings are part of a community outreach effort. We want to bring our vision and what you can see of the school to the public, to the community, with ample opportunities to have input as we get from this high level down to actually putting this pool in place with a big hope that it's going to open in September, 2026. I'm turning it over to Donna now, who will show you where we are at this point. Donna. Thank you and good evening, everyone. It is really an important step and milestone where we are right now with the project. And we're just going to begin with talking about the educational program. And this has been uh, the educational program has driven the design and it remains at the forefront of every decision we make. So the educational program was reviewed and approved almost a year ago with the school committee, and we have maintained and stayed true to the overall square footage of the school. The total program area is 70,500. 
and the gross square footage is 105,750 square feet. So although the program hasn't changed the, the areas and the program needs, we've spent almost the last year working with staff to develop the spatial relationships and adjacencies, what spaces should be next to each other to maximize time on learning, and make sure that the students have the support they need throughout the day. So this is the Fort River site, and you'll see at the top of the north part of the site, the dashed in existing building, uh, we've been able to develop the new school um, south of the existing school or southern part of the site so that the new the existing school can remain in operation and um, utilize the fields behind the school for school activities while the construction of the new school is built. There'll be a fence right below the existing building, and we'll be able to actually provide all of the attributes required for the new school as it relates to play and outdoor learning during this phase. Once the new school is built, uh, it's the summer of 2026, we'll move the students into the new school, demolish the existing building, ideally over the summer while the students are not there, and then we'll complete the rest of the site. So this site has really afforded the maximum opportunities without minimal disruption to the staff and students. The next slide, I um, just want to briefly talk about the circulation and how the site will function. The southern entrance that's located, uh, Tim, are you going to be my eyes? There you go. The southern entrance with the bus drop off loop will be independent of the northern loop. That southern drop off bus loop will accommodate 12 buses. And we've accommodated a pull-up area for the vans for the students that require additional time to arrive and depart the school. The northern entrance is, uh, as you can see in red, will be for staff parking as well as for parent drop-off and pickup. We have ample space to allow for at least 60 cars to the front of the building. And then we've even allowed for additional or planned for additional uh, queuing for parents. We've accommodated 170 parking spaces, which is required to support all of the students in the school. And you'll see that we've identified accessible parking spaces in front of the school, but we also felt it was important to locate them by the community fields for folks that are coming to utilize the beautiful fields. And as we get into the areas around the school, which is the next slide, thank you. Um, you'll see that we have really spent a lot of time developing the site to embrace the site as it is, to provide outdoor learning and play so that the students can use this area year round. Starting at the cafeteria, we have um, an area for outdoor learning and it really become a really popular uh, feature since COVID. So we want to embrace that. We have the two circles where um, on either side of the play area, which will be the play equipment. We anticipate one area for the younger students and a larger circle would be for the older students. And then a play area in between that can also be utilized year round. All of the area around the building is hardscape, as we would call it, that will be able to be plowed and used by the students year round. And we're really excited. You'll see lots of squiggles and lines, and we'll be spending the next year or so developing what's important to the students. And hopefully we can engage the students in what kinds of games and activities and ideas they may have on this hardscape. We have a couple of half court basketball courts, as well as two full size basketball courts. We also are so impressed with the outdoor learning that already exists at the Fort River School, and we want to embrace and actually enhance it. 
We have several areas for outdoor learning. We'll start at the southern part of the site where we get most of the sun. This will be for gardens. And we also have a cultivation area and pollinator garden that will also be associated with that with shade structures so that these students can use this space year round. We are also incorporating as part of the stormwater management, what we consider rain gardens. And with that, we're also introducing opportunities for outdoor learning within those areas. And then we also wanna take advantage of the natural wooded area of the site. And in here, we'll use logs and other natural features so that this can be an area for outdoor learning as well. And then we'll enter into the building. So this is the first floor plan. Um, the main entrance will be on the western part or the left side of the building. There'll be a vestibule where the main office will be able to oversee and welcome visitors through a secured locked front door. The visitors will check in once they're inside the vestibule. Once credentials are checked and the visitors are welcomed into the building, the main office staff will then allow them into the building and they can be escorted to their proper location. We've organized the building into two separate wings per se. We have the community wing up front, which has the cafetorium. That's a, gym, a cafeteria with a stage that um, will be used for community events as well as all school assemblies and activities. And then the gymnasium, which is directly across the hall from it. We have an elevator just slightly um, further down the hallway. From there, all the purple spaces, what you'll see are the academic spaces. And we'll be able to um, close off the academic wing from the community wing so that the community can embrace and utilize the school while um, making sure that the academic wing is safely secured. We've organized the academic wing so that their five classrooms per grade can be co-located. And we have project areas outside of the classrooms that will allow for small group instruction, project-based learning and individualized instruction. And Tim will be walking you through the fun part, but just you, you'll be able to visualize this as a, further down in the presentation. Each floor will have two grades. The first floor is kindergarten in first grade, again, five classrooms per grade. And we've located the special education spaces so that these students can remain with their peers, as well as the support spaces will be easily accessible for all students. On the second floor, we have what we're calling a STEM-based area, which is above the um, community spaces. We have the media center, the art room, and an STE or science technology and engineering room. And we're really excited about developing the corridor areas so that we can kind of spill out of those spaces and really make this an interactive project-based learning area. Over to the east, again, you'll see all of the purple. Uh, we have two grades um, on the second floor. We're anticipating them to be the second and third grades. But what we'd like to mention is that all the classrooms will be the same size and be very flexible as your needs change. Again, the special education spaces are incorporated into the general ed so that these students, again, can be with their peers. As we go to the third floor, you'll see that we start getting smaller and smaller with program, which is great. It really helps break down a scale of the three-story building. And the third floor, again, is primarily academic. Fifth, fourth and fifth graders will be on the, fifth, on the third floor. And we like to say as they rise in stature, in their uh, tenure at the school, they'll also be able to be advanced to the third floor. We think that will be pretty special for them. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim and he'll be able to walk you through the site in the building. 
Uh, thanks, Donna. We're going to take a walk around the outside of the building now, uh, and then we'll get inside, starting at the front door in the west where the parents will drop off. And then we're going to move around uh, to the playground areas and outdoor uh, areas outside of the cafeteria directly north of the building. Uh, you can see a light-filled lobby at the entrance with administration directly to the right to control access and greet people as they come in. As we go around through the playground to the north, you can see the cafeteria and the media center with expanses of glass to enjoy the view of the site to the north. Um, because it's north facing, there is not glare. Um, you'll see that the facade is based on masonry material, which is cost effective, but still has a lot of color available to um, express the design that is appropriate for this elementary school. And as we circle around, we can see where the playground will be, where the basketball courts will be to the west of the building. Um, the planted areas are the rain garden features that Donna mentioned that uh, will serve as outdoor learning areas in addition to um, keeping the site dry. Um, and as we circle around to the south, you can see the outdoor learning planter beds, pollinator gardens, and other aspects of the site that we will weave into the curriculum. On the south side of the building, on the windows into the classrooms, which are quite large to let daylight in, which has been a driver of the design all along, you can see sunshades, which will control glare. And then as we move to the west, you can see the entrance that uh, students that arrive by bus can go through. Um, there are stairs with lots of glass to allow light into the building. And the gymnasium, as we come up on the left with large walls, which is an opportunity for art murals, which we have discussed as being important to the culture and community of Amherst. And then you can see PV on the roof and also as you circle around the building in the parking lot that will contribute to the town's net zero goals and have the school be self-sufficient energy-wise. Moving into the lobby now through the secure vestibule, you can see the main office directly as you enter the door. There are areas for art and display. Um, there is a colorful light-filled space that you will circulate through and get into the community aspects of the building. Um, and directly ahead is a light-filled stair that will bring you to the academic upper floors. Uh, the gym is to your right here. It will be light-filled, but light will be controlled. Uh, and then as we circle around to the north, you can see through the cafeteria to the site that you were lucky to have for this building. Also in the main uh, public area of the building is the music room which will is available and next to the stage for performance. We're now gonna move upstairs into one of the project areas uh, that are outside the cluster of classrooms. There is storage for students and storage for teachers above the lockers. This is where you have space for pullout learning and project-based learning. Uh, you can notice the doors to the classrooms have large side lights to let light through the classrooms into the project areas. There is also transoms above the storage that will allow light above that into the project areas. So as you walk through the building, you have a connection to the outdoors, both through daylight and in certain areas, seeing all the way out. Here we are in a classroom looking south, so you can see the sun control on the outside. And there are two sinks in every classroom and storage uh, for all of the needs of the teachers and the students. And here you can see the connection from each of those classrooms to the project areas that are outside, with three classrooms on either side of the corridor that goes between the two project areas. And then as we leave the project area, we're going to go into the media center, uh, which is in the STEM suite. There is obviously uh, space for books, but in addition to that, there is uh, teaching technology and space for full classroom education. As we circle around, uh, you can also see that there is a storytelling area uh, for small groups and the other uh, systems that are needed for the library to run the circulation desk, the room for the librarian to work, and you notice all the glass that lets the light that comes into the um, library get into the corridor. Um, and then to review some of the sustainable features of the building, in addition to um, you know, just being a great home for learning and for the kids, uh, it's an all electric building, as Kathy mentioned. We're using ground source heat pumps, um, which is one of the most efficient ways to heat and cool the building. The building. Uh, there will be 
photovoltaic panels on both the roof and on canopies in the parking lot to get to that net zero goal. Um, and then the envelope of the building itself will be high performance um, to make sure that we will have to use as little energy as possible to keep it heated and cooled. There will also be electric vehicle charging stations and the design is replete with items that will add to the comfort, including air quality, uh, thermal comfort, um, and then not just when the building has been built, but during the construction, we keep an eye on uh, minimizing landfill waste. So there are many aspects to the energy conservation and use of the building that will contribute to the lead gold status that we are tracking toward. So <clears throat> as you'll see that the Construction cost has uh, increased from where we were at PSR, which was just uh, six short months ago. And we worked really hard, the committee, I, I really must commend making decisions to remove some items without impacting the program or the sustainable goals for the project. So these, what we call value engineering items that we've um, removed or, or made alterations to the design have been um, incorporated and we're confident that it will not impact the uh, look, feel, and the goals for the project. I'm going to turn it over to Margaret and Brian. If you could unmute Margaret, please. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Can everybody hear me? Okay, well, um, to follow on the presentation by Danisco, I'm going to talk about, as is my role, the overall project cost. And, you know, I think as folks know, this project is seeking, um, and we anticipate funding from the MSBA. So this is a way of providing, um, Tim and Donna have sort of shown us you know, shown the everybody who's assembled how we got to this number, which is the hard construction cost, which is what we'll be carrying. I, you know, I want to say um, about all of these numbers is you know a little bit like the design looks like it's complete. It's really actually far from far from complete. It's at an early level. These numbers are the same. They're very specific because that's the nature of the process is to sort of provide specific numbers. But I'd like people as they're looking at these to understand that they're still, these are still estimates. We don't, these aren't bid numbers. Um, so they're all likely to change a little bit. So I'm gonna, as I talk about this, I'm gonna round a little bit. So here we are a little over $81 million in construction, which includes this, you know, really great recent effort by the building committee to seek uh, cost savings. Um, this piece of the slide talks about the soft costs. So, so soft costs are the things, the parts of the project that are not the building. They're not, they're, they're called soft because they're not hard construction costs. So one big chunk of that is the fees, which is here is rolled up. It's the architect's fees, the OPM's fees, all the many sub consultants who work on the project and other fees for construction testing, moving, et cetera. Um, the second big category um, is a budget for furnishings, equipment, and technology. This is, um, all of these numbers are, are partially subsidized by the MSBA. Um, in this case, we have an initial budget of 1850, uh, per student for furnishings and 1654 technology. You know, as you can imagine, um, the new furniture, for those of you who've been in newer elementary, elementary schools and high schools, the furniture in these buildings makes a huge difference because it's quite different from the furniture we had in buildings, at least when I went to school. So that's a bucket. Um, that we're gonna be talking about with the building committee this coming week. And then there are also contingencies within the project um, in several different places. So there's a, there are contingencies within the construction cost to um, protect against escalation and um, 
you know, change, some changes in design. But out, outside of the construction budget, there are also what's called a hard construction contingency, which is for, you know, things that come up in the field, unexpected conditions, um, money that needs to be spent for something that was not anticipated in building design. And then there's also a smaller number for soft costs, which is additional fees if needed. So these are percentages of construction, expressed as percentages of construction and recommended by me with the um, the in input from others. So all of that rolls up to a total project budget of $98 million. Again, speaking to the rounding number. Um, the MSBA has a kind of a thoughtful, detailed way of arriving at a facilities grant. And what I have done for the uh, building committee is do an estimate based on their calculation. So this is my number, not the MSBA's number, but you know we I believe it to be pretty accurate. So again, rounding it, rounding, let's call this 427. And um, the project has benefited from the fact that the MSBA did recently bump up the amount of reimbursement they were providing. Um, so this is a little bit higher than it was even a month ago, which has been great. So that means that the town's share of that project budget, um, it, let's call it 52.3 million. And then um, as Donna and Tim did on the previous slide, this there is a half percent for art that's carried in the overall budget um, of two hundred fifty thousand. So now we're at a little over fifty five five is the town's share. So next slide. Um, one of the things, one of the immediate next steps that um, Kathy is and the finance committee are working on with the town leadership is looking at how then to apply other funding that we know we will get and some that we know we will get but can't yet estimate um, that can reduce the overall cost of the town. And that includes um, a, you know, a pretty big number of 1.6 million, which is rebates that the project is getting for Eversource because of its very excellent energy performance. Then there is also some community preservation money, which is on the table pending council approval. And the biggest question mark is federal tax credits, which you may have heard about, which are coming for photovoltaics, but we don't actually yet know the details of those. So um, more to be figured out on that and maybe other line items will come into this, but that's kind of where it stands today, so. So the next slide is the milestone schedule, which I'll just talk through quickly. Um, the biggest things to note here um, are, you know, obviously we're here at the top with the, tonight's community forum. Um, there's several different meetings scheduled for a town council and finance committee kind of going back and forth, discussing and voting uh, language for what is will be called a debt exclusion. That's the terminology for this kind of a vote. Um, the big milestone for the consultant team, as well as the building committee, is uh, March 2nd, where we submit this big package, all of these materials that you're seeing kind of the tip of the iceberg have uh, kind of go into the MSBA on March 2nd. And they will vote on the funding agreement on April 26th. In the meantime, um, the town council will vote on the debt authorization on April 3rd. And then the, the voters vote, the, um, the whole sort of community will vote on May 2nd on the debt exclusion. So um, that's the overview, but um, then Following that, there is a detailed period of design to produce the bid documents and then construction. And we are anticipating the school will be open for the fall of 2026. So I, that concludes um, our presentation and we really look forward to any comments anyone has, any feedback. Um, we'd love to hear from you.
if you want to just raise your hand and then we can unmute and allow you to speak. Oh, I hear um, Michael. I don't know if I can unmute you. <laughs> hey. Uh, I'm unmuted now. There you go. Well, thanks for the presentation. I, I, I know you guys are going to have a lot of work ahead of you uh, since this is just a schematic phase. So I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Uh, my concern, I, I mean, I really like the idea that there's lots of light going into these classrooms. Uh, that's something that's missing from many of, of Amherst schools, the middle school, and certainly Fall River and, 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 and Wildwood. So I really like the light. Uh, one suggestion I have is that I don't like windowless spaces at all. And in fact, I, 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 I'd like to sentence architects to spend their entire days in a windowless space to, 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 to see what it's like. And, and I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten claustrophobic. So I don't like small windowless rooms, but I think the work areas outside the classrooms I think you're in the going in the right direction. You, you, and I understand why they're there. I think one thing you might consider is lowering the clerestory windows that separate that area from the classroom so that you get even more light. Because let's face it, these, these, the people that are going to be working here aren't very tall. So what you want is some visual separation, but you don't really need um to keep the windows up so high so that'd be one suggestion just to to give more connection to the outside which i think is is really healthy um the other thing is um the building I, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's it's masonry uh the architect should understand and i assume they understand this because they've looked at the other schools amherst uh, is terrible shameful at maintaining its buildings. So whatever you can do to make every surface uh, durable beyond belief would be a, a, a good idea. And I have, and along that, those lines, uh, the exterior, the rain gardens and any kind of shrubbery, um, stop and think about that very seriously with little kids running around and running through it. And who's gonna maintain those, those rain gardens and shrubs on that space. Um, again, if you look around the high school, the landscaping there is all compacted and in rough condition. And that, that goes, well, there really isn't any landscaping around, very little around Wildwood and Fort River. So I would give that some thought and think about how these kids are gonna use it. The, the gardening area is great. I think that's structured and that's something that um, I think will get some really good use. Uh, students at UMass come over and help out. Uh, in terms of the walls and artwork, I, I think one of the things that, that I, I, I really looked at in a lot of schools is how friendly is a school to a young kid. Um, and I think color is not enough. I, I, I think whatever goes up on these walls has to be very thoughtful um, and carefully laid out. And I think you're right. I think these spaces could be covered with some nice murals or some artwork, uh, but be careful with that. I, I, I really think some of these large walls, um, photo murals of some sort are really effective and can be changed relatively inexpensively. Uh, just two other things um, uh, before I go to the question. Uh, CPAC, I'm assuming CPAC uh, would fund some of the recreational aspects outside the building, which I think is a very legitimate purpose for that. And that's what I would go for because they, it's very limited in what you can fund, but that would be a good use for it on, on, on your exterior spaces. And the other thing is, is the definition of net zero. I know you're going for lead gold, which is great. Is this really gonna be a net zero building? Uh, is that achievable? I, I think possibly if you use some of the site for photovoltaics, putting photovoltaics on the roof is probably not enough. You don't have a big enough footprint here. So my question is, um, is this gonna be net zero? Or how close to net zero is it? How does that 
mesh with the bylaw that town meeting had passed years ago, which I thought was too extreme, by the way. Um, and I know how difficult it is to achieve net zero. And, you know, I, I, uh, I also just want to say, I, you know, I think you guys are going in the right direction. This is a tough thing to do. And I, I do understand totally because I'm in the design profession. I know exactly what the next step is going to be and how difficult it will be to move this through design development and then working drawing stage. That is a lot of work. Uh, and I, I think people on the committee will understand that better when you come in and plop down a huge set of drawings <laughs> in front of them. Um, so the, uh, it, just to recap, my only concern is the connection of, of the workspaces to the, uh, to the classrooms, making more light available, and then thinking about uh, areas that don't have access to exterior light, how you're going to treat that so that you, know, you make those feel non-claustrophobic. And that's, that's it. Thanks for letting me speak this long. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. And and um, first, uh, Tim, maybe you can go to the site plan. That that might be a great place to start. Um, sure, pick one, anyone. That's great. So, um, Michael, first, thank you for obviously picking up on interior spaces and and recognizing our um, goals of of making every space having some form of light and and that will be our goal and we'll continue it you have many advocates in town really um, bringing home the need for natural daylight and views so so you you're in very good company in the town of Amherst and we'll continue to strive for that um, as far as the durability we, we also hear you and we recognize how important that is so uh, we focus, our firm focuses on educational facilities. And we understand how important it is to provide durable and um, material that will last for 50 plus years. And we've spent a lot of time with the facilities folks to really ensure that the decisions on choices of materials will meet their needs and keep the cost down for maintenance because we all understand how challenging that can be. Um, the murals on the walls, which is is wonderful, and we will start those conversations as well. Um, we we don't plan on just painting the walls. We really want to bring the students' art and murals into the building. Um, the site, as it relates to net zero, it will be a net zero um, site. So we will have PVs on the roof, but also in the parking lot. So we've been working with several folks to make sure that they understand what our um, EUI is, our energy use indexes for the, for the site um, or for the building are right now we're tracking below 25 and we can supplement the, uh, we'll have enough PV on site to, to provide for the energy that the building is using. So we're not buying racks. We're not, we're not doing it the, in the true sense of the bylaw and everything else that this will be self-sustaining. So I hope I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. And I, I, I just want to tell everybody on the committee and others how difficult it is even to achieve lead gold. It's it's not a walk in the park. It's it it's 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 a lot of it's a lot of work. So th thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I have one question in the chat, but go ahead, Bonnie. Oh, I, uh, you need, we need to unmute you. Try one more time. There you ah, go. That's good. Thank you for the presentation. It's really great to see these plans progressing. I had kids at Fort River and uh, this will be an amazing, amazing change to what they went to at, for their schooling. I have just a couple of questions, not necessarily about the building design, but one is you mentioned that there would be demolition of the existing building at the successful conclusion of the building project. Uh, are those costs separate or are those costs included in the construction cost? And my other question is about uh, Wildwood. I know this isn't your purview, but will Wildwood continue to be 
open for some new use or is that also slated for demolition? Um, thank you. So actually, I also wanted to state the demolition of, of the Fort River School is included in the project. And, and so are all of the PVs and, and everything. Um, as for the future of Wildwood, I'm going to let Kathy speak to that. So the, the, the future of Wildwood is a question mark right now. You know, that the it's a two-step process. Assuming this school moves forward, we'll have a vacant school, and it's currently owned by... Um, it's an education property, so it would have to be released to the town. We just started talking about um, when a big prop property like this comes online, when I say we, it's the town, I'm on the finance committee, we just started talking about reactivating a disposition. So there are multiple possible uh, ways to go. And I wanna point out that the building itself is currently heated by oil and it has no insulation in it. It has asbestos, it has had, so the, the types of things we might think of doing about it, we're gonna to have to have multiple options. So that doesn't need to be decided now. Right. Um, and I think we'll, we'll start a process that will at least start to think about what are the choices. Um, and, and then it will be open up to a much bigger public conversation. But fortunately for Danisco, they don't have to figure that piece out. <laughs> Um, right. Um, so I know um, Superintendent Morris has his hands up, but a couple of questions that have come in um, relating to the accessibility of the spaces that will meet the needs of all the students. So the answer is yes, every, every space um, inside and out will be fully accessible to, to all students. Um, Tim, I don't know if it's easier to go the next slide, maybe a more detailed slide. Um, do you want to talk through this? Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, uh, the site, with starting from the accessible parking, moving toward the building, there is an accessible route uh, from each of the parking lots across the drop-off loops. Where necessary, there are ramps and flush curbs. Uh, the slopes on all of the surrounding site are within MAAB and ADA tolerances, and there's a straight uh, level entrance to each door uh, around the building. Where there's the largest grade range at the east side of the building, there is a ramp outside the door. So all of the entrances are accessible. And then when you get into the building, um, there's an elevator. Uh, to get you from floor to floor and other than the platform in the cafeteria and one space on the second floor which we'll get to the entire floor is level and all accessibility clearances at doorways toilet rooms are accounted for and the floor is flat and then moving to the second floor the only space where the floor is completely level is the media center which is a couple steps up from the rest of the second floor to allow the uh, ceiling height that you require uh, for performances in the cafeteria, but there is a ramp to the media center. So the entire building is completely um, accessible um, and a far cry from what is in the existing uh, Wildwood and Fort River schools. Mike, did you wanna jump in with anything? You should be unmuted. You can't, you're muted. All right. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, yeah, I was just gonna add to what uh, Kathy shared about the Wildwood site, just saying that uh, as our population of the schools has declined with school, you know, 20, about a quarter fewer school-aged children than 20 years ago in the town, um, really we are trying to right size the amount of space that we're using. This is part of this proposal. Uh, we want to be good stewards of, of the land that we've been, you know, afforded by the town, uh, the elementary level. Uh, we used to use East Street School. That's been given back to the town. I know the town's been working really hard on use for East Street School. And this is another opportunity, I think, for the town to have another parcel of land. And I think there will be no shortage of ideas for Kathy and her colleagues in the town council uh, to weigh. But from the school's perspective, we're not, we, we are trying to 
have uh, what we believe is the right size of space, a right amount of space, both internal and external, you know, inside and outside space for the number of students we have. And uh, I think this is a fortuitous situation for the town, uh, perhaps not so much for the counselors who have to weigh many, many ideas, but to have another uh, parcel of land and uh, that there may be a lot of interest in in the community. Um, and I think that'll be a challenging conversation, but in a positive way, it's, a, it's an opportunity for the town to think through what it may want to do for a parcel of land that's very well located um, and close to the you know town center. So you know, I'm excited to observe Kathy and her colleagues uh, weigh that out in a couple of years from now. But from the school's perspective, we would be certainly uh, not claiming rights and be happy to um, share that with the town. Um, I don't see if anyone else has any hands. I think a couple of people might have joined a little late and someone was asking if this is going to be funded, um, fully fund, a fully funded project or will the taxpayers uh, be contributing to it? So, um, Margaret, maybe, maybe just another recap as someone was asking for that. Tim, maybe or, you want to go to one of the, oh, unmute you. Or, or, or Lynn or I can, Donna. I mean, okay, we, just so people know, you know, we, we are currently scheduling, um, unless we change this, a debt exclusion vote by the taxpayers. And what that means is that the taxpayers would pay a substantial share of what you've seen as the town share. And what Margaret said is what we're trying to decide is how much needs to go out to the taxpayers and how much um, through a combination of there's some credits on the table. The, the Eversource money is real money, by the way, um, because we went to ground stores, heat pumps, they will pay that the day the building is finished and open. I mean, it's they're giving it as a rebate because of our target of this very energy efficient building. So that money, Margaret flashed by it, but when we said 1.6 million, the last 200,000 comes if we achieve our target, but the first 1.4 million is because of the way we're um, the high, the HVAC system for the building. So we, we've done a lot of work in thinking through um, where are there opportunities, not just at the beginning, but over time, um, that we get a benefit of a much more efficient, energy efficient school. But when Mike said downsizing, we expect to save a a substantial amount of operating costs beyond just utility because the buildings right now are underused. Um, so, so Lynn, I don't know whether you want to add to that, but I don't want anyone to think that the town, this is too big a cost for the town to have enough reserves that we can do it from all internal money. We've got some other large projects coming online. Lynn, you're muted. Brian, um, can you make sure I did. No, I did. Uh, Kathy, thank you. Uh, and all of you, thank you for this outstanding work. Um, the, it, is a, it is a large price. And the town, as people know, has other capital projects that in addition to other ongoing capital expenses, like roads and sidewalks, um, that we need to attend to as well. So this will be a debt exclusion. Uh, there will be a vote at the estimated date right now is May 2nd. And at our council meeting on the 6th of uh, February, thank you, uh, we will actually start talking about the language. We'll start talking about the dates, voting sites, whether we'll do early voting, whether we'll do mail-in ballots, et cetera. So uh, because those things are not automatic with local, local questions like this, they're only automatic with state level. But again, thanks to everybody who has worked so hard to get us to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. A uh, couple of other questions while we're on budget. Why don't we start there? Um, the question was, um, in our design team's experience, so that would be Danisco and answer, Margaret, what's the likelihood of the project like this going into or over the contingency funds? meaning how likely is the project to be well over budget? Um, why don't we go to the total project budget slide with the uh, contingencies, thank you. Um, I'll, we'll start off and say that um, 
the design team, Danisco, we've been working in the public construction market in Massachusetts since our inception. Um, we are well aware of the requirements that are, or the need to put the construction documents together in such a way that document everything. And I think Michael made a comment, wait, wait till you see the set of documents, how thorough and detailed we need to be in order to make sure that the contractors who are bidding the project properly price it and understand the scope of work. We are very confident with our documents and the level of detail and completeness of them. However, um, the contingency that's up under the hard construction contingency of 5% is, is for um, unforeseen conditions. And a lot of the time that is due to unforeseen site conditions that we cannot uh, appropriately anticipate. Um, especially if they're under the building per se, like we can't go digging and exploring under the current school building right now. Um, but I, we have never been in a situation where we've exceeded the construction contingency. Um, Margaret, do you want to chime in if there's anything else you want to add? Well, yeah, I just want to refer back to the comment I made earlier, which is <clears throat> there, there's a whole separate slide you could... <laughs> you could make um, that shows the multiple contingencies. And, but I think the, the person's question is saying, you know, how, is there enough? So what I will say is that um, <clears throat> we made, when we did the last version of this. So this was, you know, six months ago when we were looking at options and comparing options, we made, you know, conservative um, assumptions about the market. And we found that when we came to do the schematic design estimate, um, the, what had really changed um, that was sort of came out of, you know, doing further design development was a better understanding of the site costs. So um, what we also did, however, at that point was we looked again at the market and we bumped up the escalation um, percentage as, as a part of this cost. So that whole conversation, um, the sort of additional cost for the site additional cost for escalation came out of detailed design, uh, the, the first level of detailed design. That process repeats throughout the project. So we, we'll stop again in several months and look again, we'll stop again. So, which is a, a very long-winded way of saying, I'm very confident at this point, but I'm confident because it's an iterative process that allows you to stop and look again, and if need be, make changes to sort of the budget in combination with very conservative assumptions about, uh, based on what we know about the market right now. So I hope that gives, it, it's a very, difficult thing I think to give confidence in this crazy market um, but it does seem like it's settling a little bit and we are being very conservative about what we're putting in here um, for assumptions to protect the community. There was one other question Nancy I see your hand up let me just respond to this there was a question about our design process and the inclusion of staff, student, or staff and administration. And, and we could um, say that we have had visioning meetings with the staff. We've also had um, many meetings to ensure that we are incorporating the features in their spaces and the adjacencies required for to provide the services required for the students um, over the past year. And we'll continue to do that. But we have absolutely reached out to 
everyone that has a space in the building to seek input as we started this process. And we've, Mike, I guess it's only been the last couple of months that we actually went back and double checked with everyone. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Are you muted again, Brian? Just make Mike a co-host would be great. You are now a co-host, Mike. Okay, uh, thank you. So yeah, I think uh, I wanna thank the design team because they've done, I think they've gone above and beyond. There was multiple meetings that they did right after the workday. So it had the greatest level of access for staff. And I think they've also done a tremendous amount of outreach for, and Kathy, you've been there for some of these for specific staff. So when you think about our specialized special education programs that require a higher level of um, unique design uh, principles uh, based on the profile of students they have. We've had multiple meetings in person and remote uh, with staff in that area. We did an in-person meeting with the Comandante staff, our dual language program to see what needs merge from that. We had multiple meetings with um, specialists, art, music, PE, right? Those kind of folks that think about that. So they really run the gamut from general meetings to much more kind of job alike and specific uh, meetings with staff. Who, whose roles are a bit more unique. When you're thinking about a gym, right? You wanna meet with the gym teacher, right? It's, you don't necessarily wanna meet with the generalist. And that's been really important, that's happened. So I really do thank uh, them. We also have the assistant principal Wildwood and the interim principal at Fort River on the building committee. So their input has been hugely valuable as well. Um, but I do appreciate all the work. And I think the last thing I'll say is that there were a number of surveys that were done uh, or opportunities for feedback that were sent out for staff who couldn't make some of the uh, meetings that we had for, for a variety of reasons. So we tried to hit all bases and in-person, remote, uh, as well as electronic feedback that could be offered um, via um, kind of electronic tool. So I really want to thank the design team. And I think from the beginning, they've really valued the, the voice of educators and been seeking the voices from educators throughout. So just want to share my appreciation for that as an educator. Thanks. You said that much better than me. <laughs> I guess it's late for me. Um, Nancy. Apparently you have to unmute me. There we go. Did. Um, um, thank you for this presentation. I think it's uh, you know, very thorough. It certainly answered a lot of my questions. It looks like a, a really well-designed building. Uh, and I'm especially, I was especially interested in what you're doing about energy costs and, and net zero and Clearly, you're paying a lot of attention to that. So lots of thanks to both the architects and the school building committee for everything that's going on. A very simple question. I'm just kind of not paying attention probably to what's going on at the moment regarding this. But this is clearly assuming that the sixth graders are moving to the middle school. I could Mike or somebody remind me of where we are with that process. Sure. So uh, that's a uh, very much in process. So that's a, the perfect word for it. So the original uh, thinking uh, on the part of myself and the school committee was that sixth graders were going to move um, actually next fall, the fall of 23, uh, to the middle school, given the space crunch. Um, even though we do have a reduced enrollment, we um, made structural changes to Wildwood and Fort River when COVID occurred uh, so that to improve our ventilation. Uh, actually, just this, uh, two nights ago, uh, I made a recommendation to the Amherst School Committee to pause that and to move the sixth graders in the when the building project occurs in the fall of 26. We feel like we can we we can make it through. Particularly Fort River will be tight on space, but we 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 think we have maps and we've mapped out how we can make that work. Um, so they're slated to take that up and potentially vote on that on February 16th. But the good news is we've done a tremendous amount of work on the design, the instructional design, where sixth grade students would be in the middle school building and whether that occurs this fall or the fall of 26, uh, we've got that mapped out. So um, really wanna thank, there was uh, last summer, there was a group of 14 or so educators from the elementary and middle school who worked on developing a plan. It was an iterative process again, where we gathered more and more feedback from the community. And I think in the next couple of weeks, we'll be uh, clear on the timeline of that. I think we're, we're, there'll be, I think we're finalizing a date for a forum sort of like this to gather more feedback from the community on what timeline that would be probably in the next two weeks. 
Um, but, you know, we do have an articulated plan written down, you know, with FAQs, things like that. Uh, but we, we may be able to make it uh, to 2026 um, and do kind of the changes full swoop all at once, uh, which may be in the best interest of kids. So that's where we are with that uh, process. But thank, uh, thanks to all the educators who spent um, a week of their summer or drafting that and then uh, lots of people who have contributed throughout. Sorry, I'm muted and I'm talking here. Kathy, did you have something you wanted to add? I, why don't you I take Alice's comment oh. first because I was just going to build on a couple of the others, so mine will be disjointed. Okay, Alice, while well, I mute you. There you go. Yes, I'm thinking back to the earlier discussions about the difference between Fort River and Wildwood and so much about the flooding. And I don't know where that, where that comes in, um, in terms of the costs of, uh, of the whole project. Are, is, is that part of the project, the part of the cost now or some taken care of some other way? The, the, because of the, the, the loaf, whatever it is, <laughs> the, that's the, the, the uh, land being so low. Yeah, thank you. So, so yes, as part of the project, we, are incorporating we're we're you know raising the elevation um, to um, bring the building up above um, the high water table by a couple of feet. Is that that was your question? So all all of the work um, that we've been talking about, what would be required, is incorporated into the project. And as far as managing the stormwater on the site, you'll see that we've actually incorporated those rain gardens and they're actually stormwater systems that we'll be able to actually benefit from from an educational perspective. Um, Mary, we'll have to unmute you. I think we have to unmute you, Mary. Yeah. Can someone? Uh, yeah. Oh, it was. Try again, Mary. Am I I'm okay now? Yes. Oh, good. Thank <laughs> okay. You. Um, just a couple things. One was um, in terms of outreach, I was wondering if it's possible to do something like um, have a charrette that's uh, scheduled more or less at the same time, like Saturday morning at the library. I know both of my kids um, couldn't make either of these because they have young children and they work full time. So young children meant they couldn't come to this one and work full time meant they couldn't come to the other one. So I was thinking someplace like the library on a Saturday morning, which um, according to <laughs> library staff is full of children, um, might be a good time to do something so that more people could um, see this. Um, the second thing was I was I've, I had some questions about um, traffic flow. I saw that you changed the buses so they're separate, which seems like a really great idea. But um, the fact that we're having twice as many students coming out of that exit um, in an already very very congested place with additional affordable housing coming down the road there and I was um, wondering how that was going to be handled and if for instance the exit coming out of the school whether that'll be two lanes so it won't bottle up with one person trying to turn left and keeping the whole traffic bottled up behind them or if there'll be something taken out of the common or how that will be addressed or is that not a school problem thank you Thank you. Um, Kathy, do you want to take, um, well, I'll first start by saying, you know, we actually uh, spent quite a bit of time with um, the town engineer in trying to organize the 
inner workings of the site to really provide a safe, a safer um, internal uh, circulation patterns. And we believe that this really will work best. Um, the buses will come in and out of the southern entrance, which actually, you know, will help alleviate some of the congestion up north. Um, we're anticipating currently every every student gets a seat on a bus, so we're anticipating up up to twelve buses for this. Um, as far as the northern exit out of the site, we have brought the entrance down just a little bit, so to allow for additional queuing to the light. But we recognize that the intersection will still remain a, a concern for the community. And Kathy, I know we've started having those conversations and understanding there are other developments coming, coming online. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Other than to say there are other, um, with the other developments going on, Mary, in that area, there is an intention in DPW and also uh, the planning department is looking at potential, the grants that are available. If um, new, there is actually a grant uh, to work on intersections that are near schools, that's its purpose. Um, and with community housing coming in, we already have some to the south on the sidewalk level, but not specifically for the intersections. So that is a town responsibility to try to start to think about how to make that work. Um, uh, so it's it's not solved, um, but it it it's sitting there. So I just wanted to can I'm just going to say a couple other things. Um, one, I love the idea of using the library and a, a Saturday show. So I think you know with the council we're just we're we're talking about district meetings, but also how can we bring this out? And I know at least one person on this call is at Applewood trying to think of. Can we bring it out to where people live as well as as to a place like Jones? So we can we can look about scheduling that. And this video is going to be posted, but we also the whole package they put together, we can be using it. So uh, we definitely plan on doing more with this. And just one other, um, as the fly on the wall, when uh, the Danisco team was meeting with the teachers and staff, what I got to see was an amazing amount of interaction where some of the initial floor plans they would bring in and they had transparency paper on top of it and the people who were going to be teaching and using those spaces move things around you know it was a really a very much of an interaction back and forth so i i just wanted to to um try to give a sense of that because it didn't have to happen in our building committee it could happen outside the building committee um and then the last piece is on the grounds one of the reasons for that $81 million is there's a lot of work on not just the ground underneath the school, but improving the drainage of the fields and the land all the way around. So one of the things we're gaining are community fields. We're, we're really restoring them. So we're getting a school and community fields, which will be available to the kids, but it'll be available after school on weekends and nights. So it is, a, um, I think it's an amazing resource. Not to mention that for the community, there's an after hours, there's a stage with a music room behind it. So we can be using it after hours. They didn't talk very much in the presentation. We can shut the, the classrooms off to be able to use it for community space, both the gym and the other, the entrance spaces. So we're getting multiple uses, community uses and school uses out of this investment. So I, I don't want let anyone to think that that money's not in there. That's one of the reasons the 81 million is where it is. And people should know we've got contingency built into that as well, not just the one Margaret showed you, but a big inflation factor and a design contingency. So there's um, beyond what is the cost of glass, we've got some contingencies built in. And I will stop because I see um, Nick Reich has his hand up. Are you still muted, Nick? Um, Brian, it's, it says Joanna. Newman. It's Joanna Newman and Rick Reich. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, 
first, I just want to say thanks for this really informative presentation. Um, my fourth grader was watching with me before and was like, I want to go to that school. So <laughs> that was that was really it was nice to hear. Um, I wanted to ask a follow up to um, Mary's question. Hi, Mary. Um, uh, um, my two sons um, have gone and are going to Fort River, and um, they. one of the ways that we sometimes get to school is riding our bikes, and there are other kids who ride bikes to school, and I'm wondering if uh, bike racks have been built into the design, and if, um, and uh, where, if like, there's sort of recommended entry, if the sort of bike flow has been considered in the traffic patterns in and out of the um, uh, in these various entrances and exits. Thanks. Thank you, um, Nick. And your son can come back and visit, right? Because it sounds like he'll he'll unfortunately um, have graduated by the time the the school. But but we love his support. And we might even get his input about playgrounds and stuff before he actually leaves. And bike racks. Would be fun. Um, <laughs> yes, so bike racks are included. Um, the level of detail is, is not there yet, but we will absolutely be providing bike racks. It's a conversation, again, to be having with facilities. The um, school principal obviously will put them in places that are easy access to the building, but we're actually you know, might want to even consider putting some bike racks by the field so the kids can bike along and, and utilize the fields on, on the weekends and off hours. Um, and we will have sidewalks, wide sidewalks entering both of the drives so that we will have access for bikers and walkers onto the site. I hope that answers your question. Mary, did you have another question to follow up? You just need to put your hand back down, okay. Mary, now that you um, found it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, was, there was another question asking if we could review the proposed surfaces and the outdoor areas. Uh, they believe there was some misinformation in the newspaper today about grass under the playground equipment. Um, so I am not... I did not see this in the paper. I sometimes get it a day late if, if that was what was stated in the paper today. Um, Kim, do you wanna walk through and describe the surfaces that we're providing? Sure, as it exists now in the design, uh, there is hardscape uh, with painting um, in between the building and the play areas. The play areas themselves where you'll have playground equipment it is a poured in place rubber uh, surface that is soft and allows water to flow through it and uh, is soft for the sake of anybody falls off uh, the playground equipment, uh, you won't get hurt. That same surface is used on this play area, which is an area that um, can be plowed or brushed off in the winter and would allow outdoor play, not on a hard surface year round, uh, you know, uh, there are quite a few months in Amherst where there could potentially be ice or snow uh, and not a place that you want to play on, but this uh, takes care of that. And then beyond those and the hardscape where the basketball is, there are the fields, um, which is grass. So I hope that answered the question. Um, Johanna or Nick, I don't know who's behind that face. There you go. Yep. Hi, it's me again. Um, thanks for the uh, clear and specific answer to my first question. Uh, we, uh, um, Johanna, who's here in the background, and I have one other question. Um, uh, we're wondering. I, you, there was a mention earlier of operating costs um, being improved at this at this site, and I'm wondering that, that that to me seems like a very compelling argument about the whole project and one that. Um, um that i think might help sway people who who have who have questions about the project and i'm just wondering if there are is like a specific breakdown of operating costs for the two elementary schools right now and sort of being able to are we able to put that side by side with estimated operating costs um 
uh, for the new building and sort of make a apples to apples comparison. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yes, I, I, I'll start, Kathy, and you can feel free maybe to jump in. Um, what we've done is we have um, taken the costs for gas and electricity, right? We're not talking about water or some of the other operational costs, but for gas and electricity, we have taken the cost of what it is for Wildwood and for Fort River right now. And then we, um, that's approximately $260,000 annually. And with this being um, an all electric and um, the renewables on site, which will produce the electricity needed for the building, um, you, you don't get a 100% payback because there are gonna be times over the year that you will um, need to utilize some of the electricity for the building in the winter, for example. But Kathy, I believe we were stating it's, it's approximately $250,000 savings annually for um, going um, all electric and uh, utilizing the PVs. That's that's just that's just the utility side, Nick. So um and uh, that estimate was based on the current projection for Fort River plus Wildwood with oil and gas, oil at Wildwood and gas. Um we didn't update it to what that's going to look like three years from now, um, where those are going. But Mike worked on as we consolidated the two schools, what other operating costs um, will be changing as well. And we have some estimates of those, but again, we're working on it. Suppose this all happened this year, um, rather than projecting what the cost of books will be two, three years or four years from now. Um, so there is a pretty compelling case that we are right now operating at a capacity that's basically inefficient not to mention that we've got energy hogs as buildings. Um, but Tim, Tim, when Tim first reported insulation in the current walls, he said, actually, <laughs> you know, the R value is what, what a, a less than one or, you know, what, but you don't have it. Um, it wasn't built with this in, in ideas. So it's beyond energy um, that we'll be saving. And Mike, you know, at some point we'll, we can put something together that is showing that. Um, and that's an ongoing savings. That's not just, a, you know, that's a, what we would have been spending otherwise. Um, someone asked what, if there's a date for when construction is expected to begin. So uh, right now, our expectation is that we will start construction in the summer of 2024. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us uh, in, in a short period of time, but yes, summer of 2024, um, we want to start thinking about if there's a way that we could potentially have an early site package or a site enabling package so that we can jumpstart the construction. When, when, so when the general contractor comes on board, uh, we can get going immediately. So we, we have to start considering um, if, if there's any benefit in having any early site packages to help expedite the process. But right now we're looking at the summer of 2024. And, and you know, I just wanna say if anyone is interested in a, a greater level of detail of timelines, if you just email me at the council, it's my last name, initial C and then at amherstmass.gov, we have more detailed timelines for what Don is just saying, you know, when will this happen? When will that happen? Including when does the demolition occur? Um, it's a quite a detailed timeline, assuming that the green light is turned on on May 2nd. So I'm not seeing any other hands, Donna, you know, just. Um, yeah, I'm not either. I don't see. Okay, Alice, Alice just raised her. Alice's hand is up. Yeah. Awesome. 
One more time, Trials. Yeah. Hey. I'm thinking, uh, first of all, I didn't thank you for all this hard work. It's very, very exciting. But I'm thinking that there will, that during, well, I started out thinking about the demolition and then thinking about other things, that if there's a way to accommodate people who come by and want to watch, that would be really, I could imagine there, that there might be people in that situation because it, it will be fun to see what's, what's going on. So just keep it in the back of your mind. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, thank you. And you know who's really going to be excited to watch are the kids, right? I mean, yes. this this is such an amazing opportunity for the students to see their new home come come to life right before their eyes. Um, we'll, we'll certainly work with um, Mike and his team on. We we usually put fence. Obviously, we put fencing. Not usually. We always mm -hmm. put fencing around it. But but sometimes we'll put like a a fabric so that people cannot look in right for distraction and and dust and whatever but but a lot sometimes we actually put like large peepholes or we'll certainly um think think about the ways that the community can watch and and see this project come to life you know and and i i just want to add one other thought that we've had you know on generating both excitement and interest. Uh, we don't have to call this the Fort River School, we can. Um, so a teacher and some people suggested maybe we have a naming contest where we get the kids and the teachers, you know, and a bunch. Um, the other thing is when the school opens, we're hoping the school itself becomes something the kids can learn about because it's a net zero school. And then the town can learn about, you know, how does this work? And we're going to have we haven't figured out yet, but energy monitors, you know, just something that explains how this building functions and it can be part of an education program. So I think there is at the beginning and at the middle and the end, this becomes a community project that's pretty exciting. Very exciting. I am very excited about it. And Kathy mentioned if anyone has any further questions at Shane C at Amherst.gov. Is that correct? Yep. Amherst, Amherst Mass, M A dot gov. Dot gov. But, um, but, but I'm listed up on the town website. So just, just email me and I'll be happy to get answers if I don't have them. And we also have a website um, that we will be posting these. Uh, community forums and all the other information as well. Margaret, sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head. <laughs> it's amherst-school-project.com. amherst-school-project.com. And it's got several tabs, but it's got um, presentations. It's got uh, background information about the project, timelines, and if there's an event, um, an opera, you can go there to find the link to get to any public meetings about the project. All right, well, um, thank you everyone. This was yeah. great. It was actually nice to see some new faces and, and we're excited, as excited as you are. Um, to really make this a reality for the town of Amherst. So continue to stay involved. You'll continue to hear from us. This truly is just wrapping up the schematic design. And so we have a couple of more iterations. We'll be entering design development on March, on April, or sorry, May 3rd, <laughs> I think is, is the date that we'll be entering um, design development. So this is not the end of the conversation, and we thank you all for all of your input. You're really, truly making this a better, a better school. Thank you all. Night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.